and he has that to his advantage as well. His father, if you look at Rocky. Yeah, absolutely. His dad, he had, you know, he was in some great shape too. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I just so well, you know, that's something too. I don't know about in, in Canada how the how the laws are, but here in the states, um, there are guys you could there are like uh, human growth hormone and testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, you see, I see advertisements uh, occasionally in the sports section. Of a, you know, a doctor who's 60 years old and just has a you know fantastic body, mm -hmm. and you know of course uh, you know, but it's because of, uh, of you know going to one of these spas and they give you um, you know testosterone and, and uh, so you know it's it's not cheap to do this, but it's totally legal. You know, uh, I mean I if I go to my doctor and say please check my testosterone levels if they are, you know, at my age, they're obviously going to be down probably a little bit, uh, some anyway, uh, and say, okay, well, put me on a testosterone regimen, you know, so, and you're right, he has the kind of money, you know, there are spas, there are spas in Mexico where, uh, you know, see, you can import into this country uh, a certain, if it's just for individual use, if you mm -hmm. went to this clinic in, say, Cancun or wherever, and they put you on some sort of regimen of uh, human growth and testosterone, and uh, you couldn't buy that here, but because it's for personal, a certain amount for personal use can be imported from that clinic in Mexico just because you went there and, and went through this regimen with these licensed physicians. Right. So uh, was totally above board. Uh, you know, but, but, you know, the crazy thing you got to look at about professional sports, I don't care if it's hockey, football, wrestling, or whatever, um, the, the guys that make it to the top of any of, the, any of those sports, they all have something in common, and that is their competitive spirit, right? Right. And the funny thing about competitive athletes is if you, on your website or on your show, you said, you know, I found out that so and so eats all green M and M's, and it gave him huge biceps. Mm -hmm. You know how many independent wrestlers <laughs> run out and buy green M and M's by the gross? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, because it's everybody's looking for that edge, just like the pro bodybuilder I told you about that said he realized to compete with these guys, I've got to do what they're doing. You know, so it's not necessarily that you want to break the law or you want to. Uh, you know, I, the funny thing is, I remember when Dianabol, as far as I know, was the you know the first anabolic that was available to the public. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the wrestlers, and it was a good friend of mine, who looked great at about two fifteen, two twenty, and he decided he needed to be two forty for some reason that I never did figure out. Anyway, he got on the D ball, and uh, he just got really held a lot of water. He got puffy. It was mm -hmm. almost like somebody put an air hose up his rear end so I could just <laughs> blow him up. Yeah, and and uh, plus at, back then this was back in the in the early early sixties, and, and I heard some stories about some guys abusing him. I guess taking too much or whatever, and had the side effects and created health problems. And um, I was lucky to be in decent shape without you know without the use of any. But I saw how he looked, and he said, maybe you should try some. And I said, you know, to get big and puffy, I just go to the buffet every day and, eat till, <laughs> and have them roll me out. Right. right, and it looked the same way. So it was never well, you know. And like when I, I said I did MPC, National Physique Committee, um, uh, master competition uh, from age four to seven. Actually, I got into it. I was, you know, I hadn't wrestled since eighty, and um, I just needed something. You know, I I was bored, I guess. You know, and I was training, helping train bodybuilding. I'm, like, I'm gonna do one show. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually won my class in, in the first show I did. And I thought, okay, one show turned into 14 over that period of time. But anyway, um, you know, it's, um, you can't look that way on drugs anyway. I, you got to just train your ass off. I know guys that say to me, well, you know, you'd have placed higher uh, if you would use a cycle or you'd have, you'd have beat that guy on a cycle. But to me, I'm thinking, okay. I'm, at the, you know, 47 or 48 or 49 or whatever I was at the time, mm -hmm. and my, I'm in good health. Um, we're talking about competing for a 
fifty dollar trophy here, not a million dollar contract, right? No. <laughs> so why would I jeopardize my help? Absolutely. You know, now in this day and age, if if some promoter or somebody's, you know, say, well, man, you know, if you just add a few more pounds, you could be making two or three million a year. Would I? I don't know. You know, um, you might be tempted, and that's the thing. But these these kids that just want to jump on drugs without ever finding out what their genetic potential is, or just, you know, the, uh, the guys that I saw at my school, too, I, I went in and they're closed now. But anyway, I, I, at one point I was going in and work with their, and they, this big guy came in and he was obviously he was loaded, right? But he was, for no reason, I said, oh, you play football? No. <laughs> you compete as a bodybuilder? No. What the hell are you doing that, right? And he was clumsy. He never, he, the guy turned into, was a horrible wrestler, as huh. it turned out. But he was just on the side, you know, just doing it to be doing it. I guess it was good for his ego. I, I mean, there's just no value to that. I don't even understand it. But, you know, this this pro bodybuilder I was telling you about that uh, it just got, you know, got his pro card natural. Now, he used only enough what he needed. Plus, you got to realize what's, what's scary for the young guys. If you're buying them out of the trunk of somebody's car, you're yeah. buying a black market. Yeah. You don't know what the hell you're getting. You know? And the other part of it is, you got to realize, like with this guy, he had a doctor that was, he was close enough to, I mean, the doctor didn't prescribe things for him, but the doctor knew what he was doing and would monitor his blood, you know, his cell count and his blood pressure. And that's the thing. You can load up on that stuff and, you know, create a, uh, a life in hell for yourself if you're not careful. But you know the problem with buying it out of somebody's truck, you don't know if you're getting the real thing, you don't know if it's clean, you don't know, you know, it's just crazy. I had a DEA agent tell me years ago that he said, you know, I'm not really at first the guys using the anabolics, but he said, if you, you know, we've raided some of these uh, outlaw labs. He said, they're nasty. There's no regulations. Hmm. Cleanliness is not important, so you don't even know what goes in those vials or those pills, you know? Well, yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, you know, so that's the problem. And, and the other thing is, like I say, find out, you know, hard work never hurt anybody. That's right. You know, so bust your ass in the weight room, eat right. That Nigel, you know, uh, he was 107, I don't know, 175 pounds when he came to me, right? Now, we used to tease him, but uh, a friend of mine who had a, a, a weight room and his competitive bodybuilder himself, a, a master's competitor, Right. And he was in the weight room the way I was in the ring. If you're not bringing your A game, don't bother to come. And uh, I set Nigel up at his diet. Mike trained him. And uh, I, I said, you know, Nigel, if you're not in the ring, you've got a Tupperware in one hand and a fork in the other, and there's rice and chicken in that Tupperware. But that's what it takes, consistency. You know, if you're going to put on some solid muscle, you got to eat right every day. It's not, one, you know, I'll eat right today and then I'll – eat crap for the next three, and you got to get in the weight rooms. I mean, it's, you know, like we were talking about earlier about learning to be a good professional wrestler. It's about devoting yourself to it. It's not just pretending to do that. So, you know, it's, and again, like I said, Richard, I, I, I you know, if, if, if Rock had veins popping out, I mean, it's almost hard to describe, but I've been around bodybuilding to know I can see this, you know, see the signs. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that he wasn't on something 15 years ago or 20 years ago. I don't mm -hmm. know. But I'd say currently now, probably just a good regimen. And again, it could, he could be doing testosterone replacement, you know, because that's totally legal. A doctor, you know, you have your testosterone checked and, and you know, and, and you can have it. So, but I'd say this, he's a hell of a guy. He's, he's, not, he's not one of the greatest workers of all time, but he has tremendous timing and a great see, that's for sure. Absolutely. I mean, there's no no doubt about that. I mean, the last, you know, the last 15, 20 years, I mean, The Rock has become, you know, aside from guys like, you know, Hulk Hogan and Steve Austin, the biggest, you know, the biggest superstar, you know, in the business. But yeah, you're right. He's not, he's not a five-star wrestler, but in terms of charisma and, you know, cutting promos and, you know, and he, he's a guy that loves professional wrestling. I mean, his entire family, you know, the lineage is just, you know, and he loves the business. And, sure. you, and you can see that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, and here's something the young guys can look at, too, is he has 
a natural, uh, the, the, the timing and the charisma is a natural. It's not something you can learn, you know. Uh, but you can learn to work. You can't teach charisma necessarily, and you can develop it. But the thing of it is, uh, all these some of these silly skits that I see guys do, or some of the silliness on, like on WWE, I thought, Jesus, you know, so, so what they're thinking is funny is just not at all to me. Anyway. <laughs> You're um, right. He is that kind of entertainer, and, and to prove the point again, the kind of money he's making in movies. How many other guys from our industry has been able to make that transition? Not many. You count them all on one hand and probably have three fingers left over, right? Exactly. You know, so yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's been, you know, Cena's done movies, but not at the level of Rock. And, and you know, you know, these guys are in bit, uh, that WWE is producing these movies. So, of course, they're in the movies. But how many guys have actually stepped out of the wrestling business, you know, and uh, become a star in, in movies like he's done? Not many. And then, then I laugh because, uh, you know, a lot of wrestling fans, they're really hard on The Rock because, oh, well, he's a part-time wrestler and, you know, he doesn't want his face banged up because of movies. Well, that's, the, you know, Dwayne Johnson is a businessman. And, and obviously he doesn't want to have his forehead all gigged up full of, full of marks because that's going to hurt his movie career. Well, yeah, the, and the, of course the Blade thing is not so prominent anymore. I remember years ago... Uh, at, a sh at a show here in Cincinnati Garden, and uh, Big Bill Miller wanted uh, Don Leo Jonathan to, to get some juice for him uh, because they were working in angle, and, and Don Leo wouldn't do it because he, he uh, you know, in a couple weeks, he heard a week or so, he was going to do tests for a movie, and he didn't want to be scarred, you know. But again, that's, you know, back then, I, that's, that's you know, it was just part of the, I, I you know, I, I used to delay when I, saw the value in it. Some guy, I just bladed, I think they were, you know, gay for it, for Christ. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, oh, they yeah. got off on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you see some of the guys had, well, there were a couple, there were a few guys that they had used the blade so, so much that they didn't actually need it. You could pop them in the forehead a couple of solid, I mean, not like you're going to knock their head off, but, you know, throw a couple solid punches and it would break the skin anyway. Mm -hmm. You know? So, um, but that's, you know, that's, that's bygone. I mean, well, like when, when Lesnar got cracked open the other night, I, wow, you know, but I mean, it was obvious that it was, that wasn't a blade job. No. He just bounced his head off of something. Yeah, it was the, you know, uh, but, uh, it was the yeah, ring well, post. Yeah. You know, I, I think now too, yeah, blood's not that important in our business. Like I say, back then we were trying to convince people our business was real. And obviously if you were leading, it was real, you know? So anyway, that's, yeah, it's, it's a different day, but still, as I mentioned, the foundation, young guys need to learn the fundamentals, not, you know, it's not, I, the crazy thing, if you, if you heard some of the goofy stories about the pseudo wrestling schools that I've heard, they're horrifying. You know, I, I had a, uh, a guy who probably weighed 280 tons a number of years ago. He'd gone to some school and the first thing they taught him was a moonsault. Oh my God. I mean, not how to lock up, not how to not how to take a back bump, but I do a moonsault. Jesus. <laughs> or I had a kid come to my uh, come to my place one time and said, uh, do you do chair practice? I said, excuse me? What do you mean chair practice? He said, oh, I was at such and such, and, and, and they have the guys beat each other over the head with, with, with chairs. Oh, my God. I said, no, we don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it, it's, it's amazing how the business has been... Uh, misused by so many people who don't really understand what they're doing. But, I mean, that's, you know, that's the way it is today, and there's no regulation. You know, you can't, the state of Kentucky, which is just south of me, right, right across the Ohio River, uh, they have a crazy thing. If you want to go to a wrestling school, you have to have a license in the state of Kentucky to be a student. Now, if you're going to my wrestling, if I've got a school in Kentucky and you decide you don't want to go to my school anymore and you want to go to OVW, Danny Davis, you have to get, get another license because the license you got with me is not a value. Now, Danny and I have to have a license to promote wrestling, but we have don't even have to know that. But they never ask you to have a license to be a trainer, nor do they ask you to prove that you actually can be a trainer. <laughs> you have a background. Wow. Which... <laughs> You know, and there should, should be some regulatory thing on that. I don't care if it's Canada or the states or where. 
you know, because there's too many idiots. You know, okay, I've watched three movies and, and I trained I trained with this guy for three weeks and his school closed or I got mad at him and left. So now I bought a ring and I've got a little building and I've rented and now I'm a trainer. You know, and there's a million of those guys out there. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, sadly enough. And, and I would say to anybody that's listening to this that's interested in becoming a professional and learning to train, find, get a resume from the trainer. What is his background in the business? Never mind who he's got an autograph from or who he <laughs> saw wrestle. What has he actually done in the business? Right. You know, and uh, if it's not if, it, if it's not creditable, then you're just wasting your money. And, of course, price, you know. You can't buy a Cadillac for the price of a Chevrolet. And no. if you think you're getting a spec, well, this guy trained me for, for $300. Well, you probably didn't get much out of the training <laughs> for 300 bucks. No, absolutely. You know what? Well, you know, with, with all the TV coverage here in the States on MTV and, and ABC 2020 and MSNBC Special Edition, we have, you know, we had featured spots on all three of those networks. Uh, I had guys from Canada, New Zealand, England, Scotland, all over the United States, and when I sold my school, I was getting four thousand dollars for six months, mm -hmm. and people were paying it. But then they were getting something for that, you know. And if, if some guys offered to train you for twenty dollars a month or something, you're getting something, but it's, it's probably not what you what you need or what you should have to become a proficient professional wrestler. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you pay for, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's that's <laughs> whether it's professional wrestling or you know whether you're buying a car or buying a house. Yeah, I mean it's buyer beware for sure. So, um, yeah. It, it, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was. Go ahead. I was. I was. No, I was just. I was just. Saying, gonna, yeah, I agreed with you. Yeah, no, I was just. Uh, so before we close the uh, before we close the show, like I like to to cover two more things. Uh, the first thing. Um, I shot you the email of the very, very sad news of, uh, you know, definitely one of the greatest professional uh, wrestling managers of all time, uh, William Moody, uh, a.k.a. Paul Bearer, passing away on Tuesday night. And uh, topic number two is uh, what, would, <laughs> what would it take for the legendary Les Thatcher to get on the social media uh, phenomenon known as Twitter? <laughs> You don't have that much money, Richard. <laughs> social media. That's these. I I don't text. I I'm a I'm a talk about antiquated. I have a cell phone I actually talk on. It's an amazing <laughs> concept. I know. No, you know I, I. You know I I I am on the internet. I have found I don't go to wrestling message boards because there's too many idiots per square inch uh, <laughs> that are smarter than I am. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Who have never taken a bump, but yet. Uh, I'm just a bitter old man who doesn't know a damn thing. Um, but yeah, that, that, you, know, you will never get me. I don't. I don't think I'll ever get on Twitter. I told uh, David Jackson, you know, uh, the promoter at uh, Wrestling Cares. I said, you know that the media. I mean, I, I'm I, I, like what I'm doing with you is fine. I, I you know, in my day I've written press releases. I don't mind, uh, you know, going to a talk show or. Or something like that, but uh, Twitter, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, it's just I don't know. It's not well, my bag. That's yeah. All. Um, but yeah, first Paul Bearer, Percy Pringle, Bill Moody. I was blessed to have been a friend of his, and I was blessed to have spent this past weekend with him in Mobile. Oh wow. Um, yeah, yeah, I was so shocked. Yeah, we've been friends. We never, you know, we never worked the same territory. We, uh, he was part of talent relations in WWE when I uh, when I was under contract to them so we spent time but, but every year in Mobile uh, uh, we get together and uh, Percy ran a uh, I, forgive me for calling for I, you know Percy he was Percy Pringle to me before he ever became Paul Bear mm -hmm. um, he had a promotion down in Mobile a, a number of few years ago and uh, I've done camps for him one of the nice I'm just telling uh, Vic Sosa that does uh the Observer show would be. I said one of the nicest compliments I've ever had in my life was uh, a couple of years ago in Mobile. A young guy came up to me. Percy and I were talking. Bill and I were talking. And uh, a young guy came up and asked me if I was going to do any camps in, in that area at any time. And in talking, uh, Percy uh, said, 
you know what? He said, attend his uh, training camps if you can. Uh, he said, because you know, whether I talk to Les Thatcher for 30 seconds or 30 minutes, I always learn something valuable about in-ring work. And I thought I could never have asked for a nicer compliment. He was a, he was a gentleman. I, uh, you know, he was riding around in the wheelchair a little bit to save, uh, so he wouldn't get short-winded this past weekend. Yes, yeah. Uh, when he came into the building uh, where we have the reunion on Friday, I guess he saw the look on my face. His son, Daniel, was pushing him. He said, oh, don't panic. He said, I'm just trying to save my wind. He said, I'm having a little pulsation or something. That, this coming weekend, he was supposed to have been in Boston, Mass, mm -hmm. uh, to do a show. But he was in good spirits. Uh, in fact, he got out of the wheelchair and danced a little jig, just, you know, messing around. He emceed uh, the uh, events on Friday and Saturday. And uh, I was born. I mean, he was a great guy. Just He was good with the young people. Uh, he would be part of the reunion down there. He used to buy tickets to see me. Uh, he, in fact, he was reiterating, you know, I'd sell my papers through the week as a kid, he said, so I could go to Fort Whiting. That was the old armory in Mobile to see you idiots bouncing around. I said, <laughs> I know. Yeah. And, uh, I, I mean, we, we were very good friends. In fact, uh, when I got, my, my wife is, is, uh, is down at, uh, our daughter's in Charlotte uh, right now, and I called her, and we started talking about Bill, and we both started crying. Yeah. Um, I've lost him. Uh, Brad Armstrong, I've known him since he was a baby. Uh, you know, we, well, at the reunion, to give you an example, Richard, uh, they do a 10-bell count, and they read off the names of all the people in the wrestling industry who have passed away in, in the past year just since the last reunion. Mm-hmm. And I was blown away that they had 75 names on that list oh my this God. past weekend. Wow. And uh, Jimmy Golden, Bunkhouse Buck, as you would know him, and Colonel Parker or Robert Fuller yep. and his brother Ron. Yep. We were talking on Saturday, and I said, you know, when I listened to them run the names off, I said, what really knocked me over was that I've worked with 80% of these people. You know, so... You know, you at I guess I'm 72. I'll be 73 in October. I, I, I you know, I still work. I still go. I have a three day on, one day off regimen at the weight room, and uh, I mean, I'm not ready to kick anybody's ass anytime soon. But <laughs> uh, you know, I, I try. I mean, I could stay in the shed a little weight, but I stay in pretty decent shape. And um, but you know, when you hear things like that, man, you realize your your own mortality. You know, and how fragile life really is. Yeah, Bill will be missed. Uh, I feel blessed to have been able to see him this past weekend and spend time with him. And, uh, you know, uh, I think all of us who were his friends that were touched by him, uh, you know, while he was here are better for it, honestly. He was he loved the business. I, I don't know anybody that didn't like uh, like Bill. I, I honestly don't. Mm. And I, I can say I was, just blown, I was just really shocked and blown away that, you know, because we just, it, it hadn't been 48 hours and we just, been together, you know. So yeah, no, it's it's, de it's yeah, definitely be, yeah, it's definitely uh, you know. Did you see the uh, Did you see the nice video WWE put on their site? Yeah, that was that was that was tremendous. I mean, that was uh, like there was yes, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what surprised a lot of us is how the the mainstream media here in the states picked it up. Yes, I know. Uh, and you know, yeah, like, like TMZ. Think, there was well, like you know, a lot. He and the Undertaker. I mean, that that was. Uh, you know, they, they uh, and he was a big part of Mark Callis, the Undertaker's uh, getting over, too. Oh, yeah. You know, Percy, uh, Percy was, he loved the business. He loved the business. And, and uh, well, you know, he never made it a secret that how much he missed his wife. She just passed away, you know, a couple of years ago. Yes, yeah. 2000, was 2005, answer. was it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Daniel, his son, posted on his Facebook page, uh, whatever day it was this, past, this week that day. He said, you know, Ned's now in the big ring of the sky and Mom's sitting ringside. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, hopefully that's that's the... And I uh, love him to death. He's a great guy and, and he was such a... made such contributions to our business. And, um, you know, and uh, he's just, just a super guy. And like I say, I just feel happy that, you know, we had a chance to spend some time, quality time together uh, before he passed. Yeah. 
and I <laughs> I think the you know ninety probably ninety nine point nine percent of wrestling fans can probably say like you know they've done a, you know a Paul Bearer impression at least once. I remember you know in junior high school my friends and I we tried to do the best Paul Bearer we could, and we actually had a phys ed teacher. And <laughs> if I ever sent you a picture less, he was the spitting image of 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 William Moody. Like just you slap some white face paint on him and put a mustache on him. He had the same yeah. same kind of physique and. Paul, you know, Paul Bearer was such a, he was such a, an iconic character, you know, larger than life, and he was so... Well, you know, and he, there, there, there's a good example, there's a good example, Richard. He lived the gimmick. When he was in, you know, when he was in, had the paint on and had the urn in his hand, he was, well, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure it's common knowledge, he was a mortician, legitimately. Yes, he was, yeah. You know, he, he ran a funeral home in Mobile. I mean, he legitimately... Was that was his profession, and um, but yeah, when when he was in in costume, he was the under. I mean, Paul Bearer. He wasn't Bill Moody. He wasn't Percy Pringle. He was the man, and, and that makes the difference between you know going to where he went and and not. You know, I mean that's that's as it is. That's right, and I think like Paul Bearer and Mark, you know, Mark Calloway together. I mean, you know, The Undertaker was such a, he was a huge, you know, large individual. He didn't need to talk, but Paul Bear did all the talking for him. And, you know, The Undertaker would just say, rest right. in peace. And then that that was such a great combination. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I'm sure Mark was very much hurt, you know, affected by, by Bill's passing as well, because they were very close. They really were. Do you think so. that... Um, like uh, it wouldn't surprise me if WWE is going to do this, but do you think that CM Punk will have some sort of, you know, quote pipe bomb about Bill Moody's passing, and that will, you know, trigger the Undertaker's rage, or do you think this is going to be working this, worked into some kind of angle? Uh, <laughs> I really hope not. I, I don't know. You know, I'm going to tell you the truth. When they when the, the rumors started that Punk was going to work with Taker, I said I don't. I'm not. I would have never booked that. Now. I'm a, I've known Punk worked Punk and Ace Steel and Cole Cabana when they were just kids and before they became famous. You know, worked for HWA a few times, and I'm a Punk fan. I, I you know I like him. Uh, I just don't see that match. You know, I, I just don't see them may having the same match that, that Taker and Triple H had or Taker and Michaels had. I, I mean, and I don't mean that as a disrespectful comment for CM either. You know, it's just. That's part of, you know, part of making the right moves in this business is putting the right people together to get the right chemistry. And I, I and the other thing is the angle that they did uh, Monday night, just I don't think it has enough teeth in it, you know? Mm-hmm. And they can cut all the promos they want. I just, well, you realize with Triple H as well as with Michaels, they took almost, they took months, not weeks, to build those things, right, and make them meaningful. And, you know, that's uh, that's one of the problems I find with, I don't give a damn if it's WWE or um, AAA independent somewhere. Uh, everybody rushes to do things, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, again, take your time. Let the people digest. Uh, if you get a chance, go on YouTube and watch Tanahachi and Carl Anderson from the last I have a pay-per-view of uh, New Japan. Okay. Carl lives not too far from me. We have lunch together every once in a while. He started with me. His real name's Chad Allegra. He's in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, but what, I mean, that, if, if the young guys listen to this, independent wrestlers, watch that match. Watch Benoit and Regal from the Pillman, sec, uh, from the third Pillman show that I did here. Uh, watch Michaels and Flair from what? four or five WrestleManias ago. Yes, those yeah. Are, those are the matches you need to imitate. Not the guys doing the quadruple somersaults off the top rope or diving through the damn rope, <laughs> uh, ropes to the floor 15 times. That's the art of those, the matches I just mentioned, that is the art of our business. That is the craft that you need to learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Les. Um, we, I mean, it was... I hope I haven't bored them. God, no. I just, not, you know, not, uh, you get me, my wife says, all you talk about is wrestling. I said, it's, it's, my, it's who I am. It's what I do, and I love it. Uh, I have a passion for it, and I'm a picky old SOB who I hate seeing people butcher and bastardize the business that I've spent all, 
all my adult life in, you know. No, absolutely. Yeah, it was a... Richard, I've enjoyed it, I, I, and I hope that, uh, you know, let me let me throw in a little plug. Absolutely. Uh, you can go to WrestlingCares.com and check out our tournament. I do training camps for any independent promoters that are interested. I do weekend camps. Uh, like I say, I was in Western Canada. I, I haven't been back to the Maritimes in a long time. Hint, hint, hint. But you can reach me. Uh, well, you can reach me at Les Thatcher at WrestlingCares.com. Reach me at Les, Les Thatcher at EPWT.com. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so I'm open to new dates, obviously, other than when we have wrestling, wrestling care stuff going on. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, anyway, no. thank you uh, yeah. for having me on and, yeah. and putting up with me for this long. Oh God, no, it was, it was, like I said, it was a tremendous honor. That's, I mean, like we, you know, we definitely, like, I'd love to have you back on the show. Like if you're available in the future, anytime you just like, we can set something up. I mean, we, I definitely want to do this again because like, you know, you're, like I said, your expertise and your your knowledge of the business. I mean, you know, it's a, it's you know, and the storytelling. It's just absolutely incredible. So you know, we definitely want to have you back. So. Well, thank you, and I've I've enjoyed it, Richard. And, and yes, we'll certainly do it again sometime. All right. Thanks very much, Les. Thank you, my friend. Take care.